Welcome to Backstage with Richard Ridge. The Repertory Theater of St. Louis is one of the most honored and celebrated live professional theater companies in the country. Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express, which has been adapted for the stage by Ken Ludwig, is playing on the main stage now through April 9th and is directed by the Rep's artistic director, Hana S. Sharif. It's 1934, just after midnight, and a snowstorm has stopped the opulent Orient Express sleeper train in its tracks. A wealthy American businessman is discovered dead, and the brilliant and beautifully mustached Hercule Poirot must solve the mystery before the murderer strikes again. Agatha Christie's plot-twisting masterpiece takes audiences on a suspenseful thrill ride, and my guest is one of the show's stars. Please welcome Ellen Harvey. Hi. <laughs> So first off, how are you and where are you? Well, <laughs> I am well, it is early. Um, I am in St. Louis, obviously, to be yeah. at the St. Louis rep. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, I've, I've toured through St. Louis before, so I actually was really excited to come back because there's so much to do here. There's Forest Park, there's great restaurants and lots of culture and museums. And so it was like one of these things of like, not only do I get to do this play, but I also get to like come and visit a place that I've enjoyed in the past. So it was great. Okay, so you were co-starring in Murder on the Orient Express. How excited are you? Uh, it's it's great. It It's, uh, I, you know, doing some more research on this. And of course, I read the book all over again. Um, I had no idea that like it is the second most sold book in the world next to the Bible. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> Oh my gosh. But I think about it as even as a kid, I always like there was always a copy on my grandparents shelf and everybody knew the story. So it's really fun to see audiences a that either totally know the story and are here just to really enjoy the, the lushness and the richness and the gorgeous costumes and the great language, but also the people who have never read it and you hear the gasps at the end of the show. So it, it's it's really fun fun to do this kind of a play. Yes, I was going to ask you, how much fun is it doing this show? Well, my character specifically, which is Helen Hubbard, which is I'm an actress playing an actress playing a character. And so not to give anything away, people, but um, so it, it's what Ken did was actually take a lot of license and liberty from the book and sort of make her more of a musical theater -y character. And so my, she's, it's like, I dance a little, I sing a little, and it's really funny. And so getting to, having Ken, Ken threw in those little morsels, as well as other characters that have a bit of comic relief. So you really do get the counterbalance of the, the, the story, the, the idea of the story, which is what is justice, along with some more lighthearted levity moments where people can kind of laugh and relax and it's a traditional kind of can play. So it's, I, I, it's fantastic. It's great. These characters are so beautifully written, not only in the book, but in Ken's play. So like, what do you love about her already? Like, you know, how fun is she to play and like, you know, getting lost in her world? She's so, first off, I look absolutely stunning. Our costumes were done by Fabio Tablini and they are I mean, drop dead gorgeous. They are, I mean, I feel like a million bucks. So you walk on stage and you're like, the costume says it all. Um, but it's doing doing her specifically, originated by the incredible Julie Halston, I should add also at the McCarter. Um, I had so much fun finding out who this typical American was in, in, you know, in Istanbul, starting out on the train, but finding out the, the, it's it's a fine line of playing a, an over the top comic character and then also play, but to really play one who is sort of grounded in her own innocence. So rather than her being just obnoxious, I grounded her in more of a sense of innocence. So you people just kind of can roll their eyes at her and not be mad at her. <laughs> yeah. um, so I have a blast because my favorite, I, I love at the end when it is, not spoiler alert, spoiler alert, when when they acknowledge that I have been part of this, um, part of this scheme, um, I just simply bow my head as if I'm taking a bow and the audience gasps. And so I'm like, I did my job, I did my job. But she's she's loud and she's, you know, she's irritating, but she also, she has a heart and she does, she is concerned about things. Um, 
I have loved sort of creating an aspect of her where I think she thinks in her mind that she's a Nancy Drew type. And so she sort of follows him Poirot around and is like offering up clues all the time. And he's just like, oh my God, go away. But so I, it's been really fun to play a character playing a character and then have the reveal and see the audience reaction. You know, you talked about your beautiful costume. I mean, talk about the first time you saw yourself in the mirror with the costume, oh. with the makeup and the wig and everything else. Like what went through your mind? I mean, I was snapping pictures in my fitting. I was like, this is going on IG. I was like, this is just too beautiful. Um, but he, it was, the, I am one of these actors that it's like, if, if, if the wig and the shoes are there, I can pretty much, I can work with whatever is given to me. That is a visual and it is also a visceral. But when I put this costume on, I was like, oh, I am, I am in 1934 and there is no question. And the detailing and the beautiful, they have incredible, incredible uh, seamstresses here. The whole costume shop here is hands just unbelievable. And the workmanship and the quality and the, the Scottish wool that I, my suits are custom made on my body. And it just, the lavishness and the fit and the style and my cute little blonde Bob that moves around. Um, he also, our costume designer designed uh, a couple of my costumes out of um, Coco Chanel's design uh, for Nora Garner, I think it is, uh, from, an, from an old, black and white movie and so some of my designs are straight like pulled off the page from Coco Chanel so I'm like I uh, everybody's like you got to steal those suits <laughs> I was like I can't but it's what it can bring you into that world instantly by putting those clothes on I was like take one put one in your suitcase say I don't know yes, where it went <laughs> I thought I'll go I'll go and like buy a suit off the rack and maybe they won't notice that I've taken <laughs> one with me <laughs> You know, but that's the St. Louis rep. I mean, the costume shops, the scenic shops, I mean, the lighting, everything is perfection there. And let's talk about your director, yep. Anna Esperi, who is the artistic director. I mean, what makes her such a wonderful director to work with? Well, she is, um, she's very, very clear about the goals. And this was never just a play about you know, funny lines, and it was never just a play about a train, but it was a chance. And also we, and the great thing about Hannah, of course, is that right off the bat, our cast is incredibly diverse and incredibly talented. And, um, and you've got, you know, we're doing, people are doing eight different accents in this show. It's all over the place, but she focuses everything into what the important moment is, which she wants her audiences to walk away talking about what is justice because that's a global, that's a global question. Then and now, this play was, you know, the original book was written on the verge of World War II. And we still have issues with this. And what is, what is justice? What does justice look like to you? Was this justified? Is this, and so that never left the room. And also she brought in her top team of designers. She brought in everything possible. She's like, this is going to be our home run. And, from what I understand, we have been lauded quite nicely in the papers. I don't read them myself, but um, it, it, that's, that I think is that her vision of what this needed to be and the importance of this story absolutely never left the room. Yeah, and it's also an incredible audience that come to see stuff at the rep. That's what I love. It's such a diverse, older audience, younger audience, new new audiences that are being introduced to the theater for the first time. And you have like, there's ASL performances. I mean, there's so many wonderful things that they do, right? Yes, exactly. I mean, like yesterday we had the 10 a.m. matinee and they said, we have over 900 students here. So we're actually opening up to the theaters. The theater is kind of amazing because it has its, it has its more intimate space, but they have big walls that can block off side seats. And so when we have the student matinees, they open those bays up so that it's not like, it's like, come one, come all. And we were packed at the 10 a.m. matinee yesterday. And I thought, this is amazing. I mean, this is what exposing exposing young people, not only to this script, to this play, but to arts and to the theater and what live theater is. And 
those are the moments where you think in your heart, there might be one person out there, one, one young person that you change their life because you look like them or they, they've always wanted to do that. Um, it, it, it's just, it's fantastic that they have the space. They have the space to bring in these many people is pretty astonishing for, for a Lord theater, for a regional theater. Yeah. Oh no, it's one of the best. I, I already spoke to Hannah. I've had her before and she's just yeah. loveliest. I mean, her mission and everything else is so great. This open heart and does everything she wants to do. What's it like living in the world of Agatha Christie and Ken Ludwig's words? Uh, it, it's great. I mean, I, I, I just originated Ken's latest play down at the alley. So I sort of this, and then just coming off of that and then doing this. Um, so I feel like I sort of know Ken's words pretty well, having worked with him on the new script. Um, but he has such his love for language and the lyricism of language alone. And of course he is such an enormous fan of old movies. You know, his favorite, favorite movie ever, and I'm not giving this away, is The Court Jester. Like he loves the banter and the back and forth. So he knows he knows the canon of old classics very, very well. He is a musical aficionado genius. So the way that he scores even some things um, with music is incredibly important to him. But getting to live in this world is just, it's delicious. And the language is delicious. And these characters are so great. It's it's glamour, it's glamour, it's intrigue, it's mystery, it's comedy. And uh, I mean, I half of my family is is in Sweden. And so, you know, the minute that I got this play, they were all like, oh, we know that play. Half the things I do, they they're not necessarily know anything about, but I but this one they knew, this one they knew because it was murder on the Orient Express. So it's global. I mean, it, it's yeah, it's it's wonderful. It, it really is wonderful to do this show. Yeah. So you just created, you originated a role in Ken's latest comedy. Yeah. What was the show? It was called Lend Me a Soprano. Uh, we did it down at the Alley Theater in Houston. Uh, it was a brand new fresh take on Lend Me a Tenor, mm -hmm. where the roles are reversed. So the women are all in charge. And we had the extraordinary director, uh, Eleanor Holdridge directed us and Ken was there, of course. And what was really wonderful was Ken, Ken didn't just flop the lines over to us. Yeah. He wanted our feedback. It had to be words that actually women would say. And there would be times in the script where like a woman would not talk to a woman like this. He goes, all right, let's change it. What do you think? What did, what'll it be? What did it be? So he was so open and listening to us and trusting us as the actresses to understand the behavior and the comedy that can derive from two actresses as opposed to two actors. Um, so that was that was just the absolute best. That show was just, it was, it was, as some people said, funnier than the original. And there is something very funny about, that's another thing, a little bit in this show, it's like, there is something very funny watching people in beautiful clothes make asses of themselves. In the Agatha Christie world. In the Agatha Christie world, yes. Yeah, so I mean, I'm addressed to the nines and I'm making an ass out of myself sometimes in this show. <laughs> you know, Broadway debuts are really special. You know, they only happen once and there are so many people trying to work their way back into the theater and trying to get to Broadway and everything else. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your Broadway debut and how magical was that? What do you remember? It was amazing. It was with Susan Stroman and it was The Music Man and back in 2000. And I remember, I mean, I think I still have on like some camcorder somewhere in a thing. I recorded myself walking through the stage door when we moved to the theater, because I was like, this is, this is, this will never happen again. I mean, meaning it, this is the one, this is the first time that this is happening for you. It is a moment, it is a moment. And I remember just being so overwhelmed, um, <clears throat> working with that company, working with Rebecca Luker and Craig Bierko and just everyone and Stro. It, it was, I was surrounded by, by young people and Broadway vets and to be welcomed into that family and to be part and a feel, to feel a part of the Broadway community and to be doing that iconic American show. 9-11 um, happened, you know, a year and a half later. Um, it was, 
I just couldn't even imagine a better show to be a part of with an extraordinary, extraordinary cast. But it is, it is, um, you know, it, it's it's in, so incredibly special, and I have never forgotten it. Never take it for granted either. It, it's really great. That was such a special production. I still call it the Alvin Theater. Was it or was it called the Neil Simon by the time you went in there? It was the Neil Simon when we went in there. Yep, I yeah. think it might have just changed. <laughs> but I remember there were so many. There were so many Broadway debuts and young Broadway debuts, yes. and yeah. extra Broadway debuts. Where she, you know, she she discovered so many of you. I just remember that so I mean, so vividly. There was there was Cameron Adams and Clyde Alves and you yeah. know all these people that were just starting as I would call them babies, but I mean obviously yeah. they weren't. But um, and to also watch them, I mean to watch the people, you know, the kids, the kids that were my kids, you know, grow up. Travis Wall, Travis Wall yeah. from So You Think You Can Dance was my child in the show. He was ten, yeah. and to watch him grow up and become what he has become. I, it's just, I mean, it, 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 yeah, incredible, incredible production, incredible people. And now Clyde Alves is co-starring in New York, New York, and he's got this incredible tap dance number on oh. the themes of New York City as some high rises going up and he's stopping the show every night, but they were all kids in the music band just starting out. I know. I mean, I cannot wait to see that show, obviously, because it's, it's a straw and it's big and it's like, I know so many people in it and I'm, oh, I'm so excited to see it. And it's Candor and Ebb. And it's Candor and Ebb, yes, yes. You have worked with so many incredible people. I mean, I've seen you do everything in New York, but I was looking through your stuff the other day and I'm like, oh my gosh, she started out with, you work with Kevin Klein in Present Laughter. I remember that incredible production. Favorite memory of working with Kevin Klein and working on that show for you is what, Ellen? <sighs> wow, there's a lot, there's a lot. That was one of the top five experiences of my life and that, to be uh, to be in the room and to be uh, to be working with him, iconic legend. We, you know, we would come off stage and then we would stand in the wings every night and watch because you. It's like this: you're watching, you're watching genius happen live every night. You never quite. I mean, he is in the moment all the time. But I think my favorite moment with Kevin. Oh, there were many, there were many. Um, I don't know if I should say this one or not, but- um, he, Go ahead, it's only Broadway world, it's only going around the world. Yeah, I know, Just, I'm like, maybe you should here say it. But he, there was one night after the show and we, we would climb up the stairs of the St. James to get, I would go to the way top and he would go to the first floor. Um, and he stopped me on the stairs and he pulled me over and he said, he said, I just want you to know, he said, uh, Barry Sonnenberg was here last night at the show. And I was like, oh, oh, how nice. I said, oh, how lovely that he got to come and see you. And he said, I just want you to know, our scene was his favorite moment in the whole show. And I'm like, literally my face dropped. And I was like, oh my God. He said, I just thought you should know that. And I, <laughs> and I was just, I went home and I was like, oh my God. Um, but he, he was, uh, you know, he was so gracious. He's, Kevin was also one of these people, he doesn't give opening night presents because he wants to know who you are. He's not just going to buy a random gift and give it to you that says present laughter, you know, 2017 on it. He waited to get to know each of us when there was time, when we were open with the show and then came in with very, very specific gifts for every person. And I used to sit backstage and do a crossword puzzle while I was waiting between scenes. And so my Christmas present or my Christmas, my, my, my gift, my opening gift from him was he had hand painted me um, wrapping paper that was holding about five different crossword books. And so I still even have the, the, the paint because he's an amazing painter. And I still have that piece of paper that he painted <laughs> up on the wall. I'm like, it's a Kevin Klein original. Um, but it's, we are so lucky as artists to be able to work with people like that. And how wonderful that, I mean, he's a huge star, but also an actor at heart. And um, we used to talk about Hal Prince a lot because he's like, my, I gave my career, my career started with Hal. And I said, yes, because he had said, did you know Hal from Phantom? And I said, yes, I did very well. And so we, 
you know, to see him just really go back to his roots of the theater where he loves being. Um, and to be able to work with someone like that to me was an absolute gift, dream, once in a lifetime thing. Okay, you just mentioned who was my next person anyway, the late great Hal mm -hmm. Prince. Hal's all over my house, just I so you know. I know, I'm looking at the posters behind yeah. you. I <laughs> loved Hal, Hal was one of the sweetest men to me throughout my career when I was starting it and everything else. He was always such a gentleman and I just redefined the American musical theater in general. You worked with him on Phantom of the Opera, yes. Madame Giri. What was it like working with Hal Prince? It was incredible. It, he, he is, he's the real deal. I, everything, his, ugh, it's so, it's, I'm almost speechless because he cared so much about the show. He would drop in every couple of months, watch the first act, pull us into the into the stage management office, give us some notes. Um, we'd talk about stuff. Um, he never stopped being the, the, the captain of that ship. And every note was specific and clear and intentional and and being in the show and seeing how seeing the thought process of why things are the way that they are. I mean, coming, I came into the show, what, 25 years after it opened. Uh, I was with the 25th anniversary cast. And so you're like, oh, well, this is interesting. Everybody's going to this side of the stage or this, is, you don't have the, the dramaturgy behind it. And so sometimes when Hal was there, I was able to ask, I was able to find out stuff from him, but he, nothing was ever frivolous. Everything was absolutely on point so caring, so kind, so specific, so demanding, demanding of us to be our best and do our best. And I, it, it's, oh, I just, I, I loved every minute that I got to sit and talk with him and go through stuff with him. Yeah. See, that's why, you know, I used to go back I, to Phantom like every year or whatever, and it always looked like it opened three months before because Hal used to come in and give notes and just visit like George Lee Andrews. He'd go upstairs to his dressing room and sit in there and they just tell old theater stories or whatever else. But there wouldn't be a phantom without Hal Prince. I know that Carol Burnett is trying to get the Majestic Theater renamed the Harold Prince Theater. Yep. And I, I am definitely someone who would love to see I have, that happen. I have signed all of her petitions yeah. for that and I have lent all my support to that <laughs> um, because I am, it 100% should happen. No wouldn't concern. that be cool? I mean, the man who like, you know, defined <laughs> The he changed people. the landscape of yeah. Broadway single-handedly. Yeah. The canon of his shows, but also the imprint of the longest running show ever in the history of Broadway. That's the least we could do for him is to name a theater after him, you know? Yeah, so, we have yeah. to talk about another, yeah. We have to talk about another yeah. great person. One of my favorites too, Daniel Radcliffe. You got to do How to Succeed with him eight times a week. Let's just talk about that man's heart and his professionalism and just personally with Daniel Radcliffe and being a part of How to Succeed, what it meant to you. Dan is one of the most extraordinary performers I've ever met in my life. And part of the thing that I was so amazed when we worked together was that this was a man who was globally famous, money, not a, not a problem. And yet he chose to put himself into, into a, an arena that was not his forte. And from the get-go, he said, if I fail, it will be my fault that I didn't do the work or I didn't do what I needed to do. So a year ahead of time, he started singing lessons. He was doing dancing lessons, working with someone. Rob had given him some key steps that they were going to do um, in Brotherhood. And so he would get to work in them. And he learned the language of Rob, I guess is the best way to sort of say it. I have never seen someone work so hard to be so good and so specific and to not let people down and to see the way that he acknowledged his fan base and he recognized that, you know, that he, he has an obligation to a whole generation of movie fans and book fans having been Harry Potter and that he recognizes that that's a responsibility and so he was always kind and went out to the stage door and would do a little you know a few signings and then go back in but his 
his drive, his talent, his passion, his professionalism, his kindness. He was the, I mean, John Larroquette is how many years older than he was at that point? And it was Dan who was the absolute captain of our ship on that and um, and set a tone for everything and the family that we had and the 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 love and it was always a positive environment always always and he was magnificent in the role i i love what way do you, way do you see i don't know if you saw merrily we roll along yet way do you see the him and the three of them in that when that I'm comes probably going to weep profusely um yeah. you know i mean it's it's i mean i did when i saw uh what was it um uh, the martin mcdonough play which just went out of my head oh the cripple of Inishman. yes thank you yes um, I'm always, I, I just sit and I beam like a proud parent, which is kind of ridiculous, but uh, having known, knowing him and knowing sort of his, what his childhood and what the trajectory and what, what fame could have done to him and how he has turned it into something entirely different. He also, he said once, he said, you know, a lot of people ask me if I want to work with Scorsese and he said, no, I want to work with the next Scorsese. And that's why he does all these independent films, all these yeah. smaller things. It's not about the fame and the money. It's about the work. It's about the creativity. And that was the exact same approach that he had with us doing How to Succeed. And so I am just, yeah, I am so proud of him and cannot wait to see Marilee when I get home. I'm, yeah. I'm thrilled. Well, I know the Rob you were talking about is Rob Ashford, who directed yeah. in Crap. And like I said, that was some dancing he did, you all did in Brotherhood of Man. How did, how did it feel to stop the show every night with that incredible number? <laughs> it was, I mean, we, we didn't know how it was gonna, we didn't know, I mean, until we first did it, how anybody yeah. was gonna respond to it. And and I remember in the rehearsal hall when, <laughs> when we were trying to figure out the logistics of me yeah. doing this on the back table, singing high, high A's at that point. I'm not sure if that was, that wasn't the A, the C was at the end. Um, and just like thinking in my head, I'm like, what does this even look like? <laughs> like I don't know. And so it was, it's pretty, the way that it is choreographed obviously is a big swell and you come to the final chorus and we're in the V and it's all powerful and it's great. Um, it was pretty remarkable. It was, I mean, that number is a beast to begin with, um, but it, it, yeah, really, really fun, really exhilarating, really energetic. And I think that the, the dramaturgy of telling the story in that number was done so well. And that's a big thing too, that it's not just a big number, it's actually about continuing to tell the story of where he's, you know, pulling everybody in and yeah. I watch that number a lot on YouTube. If I ever need a little lift or whatever, you know, on a busy week, <laughs> I, I just got to watch them all do, you know, Brotherhood of Man, you get goosebumps on the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, yeah. watching you all do that. My final question for you is, what do you hope audiences take away after seeing this gorgeous production of Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express? I, I hope they, um, one, I hope they decide to come back to the theater. I hope that we encourage more and more people that it's safe and that uh, it's a vital part of our communities and that they recognize the importance. Um, hopefully we are giving them thrills and spills and goosebumps and and uh intrigue and all of that but i really i think again the thing that hannah talks very specifically about which is what is justice and it, it, there's many different connotations about that in our in our world there's the biblical one there's the legal one and to start a conversation I think that's a big part of it. So come, come for the enjoyment, come for the glamour, come for the humor, come for the brilliant performances. Our Armando Duran as Poirot is, mm, is so delicious. And, um, and walk away maybe having a conversation with your partner or your child about how, how, how and why do we need judicial systems and what is justice and all of that. So, yeah. Well, like I said, no one does it better than the St. Louis rep. So once again, Ellen Harvey is one of the stars of the repertory of St. Louis Murder on the Orient Express. Now through April 9th, for tickets, go to repstl.org. Ellen, always a pleasure. Nice to see you. Thank nice you for joining to see me. You. Thank you so much, Richie. And thank you for doing this so early. You, you have to go to rehearsal next, don't you? Oh, no, I have a matinee. <laughs> oh, okay.
You're going to do a show. Going to do a show. Exactly. Have a great, everybody. We'll see you at the theater. Take care, everybody. We'll see you soon.